Hello, Laura. So, hi. Hi. Great to see you. Just need to check the, the, the time if we're so. I don't know. We're about, we're about right here. Nice to Great. see you. It's been a while. Nice to see you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and hello, everyone in the, in the comments. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, lots of people. Um, so anyway, so it's really great. I think uh, I was just trying to think when we first met, and I believe that was at the film festival. Yeah. In what was that? Twenty fourteen, I think. Something like that. Yes. Wow, yes. It's been it's been eight yeah. years. That's wow. I can't believe yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome, and I just want to uh, introduce you. My my name is uh, is uh, I'll just shouldn't say that, that my name's Olga and. Uh, I'm today a psychologist, but also someone who spent years in psychiatry, tried a huge number of drugs, and uh, I'm off them, like yourself. Um, anyway, Laura, you've been, if I believe, you you were admitted into the psychiatry when you were about 13 years old, and I, if I remember rightly, something like nine, you've tried at least 19 different types of psychiatric drugs, right? Yeah. So, and then you spent, from you were 13 years old, to oh, 14 years in the system before you uh, found a way out in 2010. So since then, uh, Laura, you, you've uh, created the, the Inner Compass initiative. Uh, you've also got the uh, Withdrawal Project and you are working on a book, which is called Unshrunk, which uh, I don't know how far you're in that one, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to, to reading it when it's, uh, when it's ready. So, but anyway, very warm welcome to you and uh, You've got half an hour and I will try and keep an eye on the questions and answers and things. And uh, yes, please. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Olga. And uh, thanks to the Institute for having me. It's an, it's an honor to be here. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see so many familiar names in the chat. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about psychiatric drug withdrawal. I'm going to, I'm going to start with my own experiences of it um, and then kind of pan out to share about the lessons I've learned um, as someone who's gone through withdrawal about myself and about just what it means to be human really um, and uh, and you know I'll hopefully touch a bit on the the broader issues that are at play um, in this in this incredibly important, um, issue of withdrawal, which of course affects whether the millions and millions of people out there on these drugs realize it or not, it, it, it has a very significant effect on them. Um, so just to, 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 and I should say, I'm not going to get into any of the technical aspects of coming off. If anyone's interested in learning about safer tapering protocols, um, the withdrawal project at withdrawal.theundercompass.org, I see um, it's been linked to down there. We have a self-directed manual written in step-by-step -step detail with pictures, instruct all comprehensive information um, to help you teach yourself about how to taper off safely. So please uh, to find, find those resources there, it's all for free. And you can also find us um, on Facebook and Intercompass Conversations where we have regular live streams about withdrawal. And then we'll be launching a new community this summer online off of Facebook. Um, so, so stay tuned for that too, if, if you want to join our community. Um, so withdrawal, uh, to, to jump right into my, my experience of it, um, just a quick backstory of what led me to decide to come off. Um, you know, I, I was, as Olga said, I was psychiatrized as a kid and I spent, um, my teens and twenties deeply believing in the medical model, um, self-identifying as bipolar among many other labels taking all kinds of meds, believing very deeply in the, in the meds, even though they never actually helped, but just kind of holding out hope. Oop, I'm gonna close my window, excuse me. I'm realizing there's background noise. Okay. Um, yeah, just holding out hope year after year that eventually they'll kick in um, until I lost that hope. And by that point I'd been told I was treatment resistant and basically, you know, I believed I was just so defective that even the best treatments were going to help me. <clears throat> and, um, and it wasn't until 2010, as August, August said, when I had 
what I see as three catalyzing events um, uh, happen that forced me to step back and question my relationship to psychiatric drugs and diagnoses and mental health professionals. And each of these experiences involve um, encountering force and coercion, um, which I had never encountered before as a good patient. Um, so I, I was forced into the hospital. I actually wanted to go. I just wanted to go home first to get my belongings and, and security got involved. Um, I was forced to take a drug I didn't want to take. And I had a, a police police called on me when I slept through a therapy appointment to do a, a wellness check. Those three experiences made me realize that my faith, my unquestioning faith in the system um, had meant that I basically surrendered ownership of myself. Um, and I was, so I was in that place of questioning. I was on five meds at the time, going to a day treatment program for so-called borderline. Um, and it was at that point that I found Bob Whitaker's book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. And that was really what clicked me into my conviction that I needed to come off of these drugs. Um, I realized, you know, after spending the most formative years of my life, believing I had two options in front of me, you know, treatment resistant mental illness or suicide, basically, uh, Bob's book helped me see that maybe there was a different option out there for me. And I didn't know what it was, but, but it ignited really curiosity in me. And so curiosity was the driving force. I would say that, that led me, um, into onto my withdrawal journey. Um, I should say when, when I came off of psychiatric drugs, I had no understanding of withdrawal, um, no understanding of physical drug dependence either. Um, I, I was, you know, I was so so fired up about the long-term adverse effects I'd experienced from taking these drugs that in my mind, it was logical. Oh, I got to get these things out of me as fast as possible so I can move on with my life. Um, little did I know that, that, um, that approach was, was entirely backwards. And as we say at the withdrawal project, the, the fastest way for most people, most of the time to get off and stay off psychiatric drugs is to taper very, very slowly. And of course, slow is a subjective, vague, you know, vaguely defined word. Um, most people think it means weeks, months, a year. Um, for many of us, especially taking these drugs for a number of years, it might mean multiple years of tapering. Um, and so while that might sound like, oh my, oh my gosh, you know, I'm gonna be on these drugs forever. I'm never gonna get my life back. The, the paradox is that if you come off of them slow enough, as I didn't, um, to avoid really destabilizing your central nervous system, you actually can get back to your life faster than if you come off really fast and then are disabled by the drugs for potentially and by withdrawal for potentially many years. Um, so I knew none of this in 2010. I was just, I want to get off of these five drugs and I, I want to do it as fast as possible. And my, my psychopharmacologist on my giant treatment team at the borderline center um, agreed to bring me off a few of them, not, not certain ones. Um, I didn't have any emotional support from him. Uh, I, he basically said, you know, he basically implied that he viewed this as a mistake and that I would regret it, but he wasn't going to stop me. And, um, and so I came off of five drugs in about six months, which is cold, basically cold Turkey. Um, and, and when I, you know, when people ask me, what was your withdrawal? Like it's, it's hard to, it's hard sometimes for me to distinguish what were the long-term iatrogenic effects of the drugs from withdrawal? Because I was already so, um, to put it like crudely, just messed up <laughs> by being on the drugs and that it wasn't that I was stable and then I came off and was not stable anymore. I was, my life had been in shambles for years by that point, but I would say what withdrawal looked like for me in the first year was um, just the amplification of my already quite, um, quite like warped and magnified, uh, emotions, which, which, you know, so just intense paranoia, um, quick to anger, 
just anxious all the time, um, really just feeling like I was drowning in despair all the time. Um, cognitively, I already had years where I could barely read, um, you know, all along thinking it's because of how mentally ill I am. But now, of course, I see you're on potent psychoactive <laughs> drugs, they'll, that'll do it to you. But my cognitive functioning really fell apart in the first year, just my ability to articulate myself, to, to speak, you know, I'd have so much in my head and I would try to translate it into words and it just never felt like I was doing it. I, 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 my focus and ability to absorb information was even worse than it was before. My memory was even worse. Um, and physically I had so many strange and intense <laughs> experiences happen, you know, everything from having boy, when I came off of lithium, just these horrible boils burst forth on my, on my cheeks and my neck and my shoulders and my back. And they were so painful. And they were, you know, the size of, of peas and just, it was agonizing. I had horrible stenches coming out of the skin on my chest. I had chronic headaches in the first six months. I had random bouts of spontaneous vomiting. Um, I, I had horrible digestive issues. I mean, I could run all on along the list of physical things. It would take minutes. Um, and, and in many ways, I see with retrospect that my lack of understanding of what was happening to me, because I didn't really understand withdrawal, ended up benefiting me because I didn't have this story that, you know, oh my gosh, I'm in withdrawal. It's going to last for years. I'm screwed. What have I done to myself? I was just, mm. I was so uprooted and disoriented and unsure of up from down. I just, I always say, I just bumbled along and I was in, in misery. I mean, the, I didn't even mention the insomnia, which was probably the, the worst of it. Just months and months of sleeping, you know, a few hours a night total and watching, get, getting through basically by watching, tele, by watching shows, especially South Park. That was my like go-to show. Um, but I, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't have a narrative that I was imposing on my experience. And I think that helped me because I didn't create a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of any kind. I just bumbled along. And, and along the way, of course, I was you know, reading many more books beyond Anatomy of an Epidemic. I, I read Joanna Moncrief's work, um, Marsha Angel's uh, book, The Truth About Drug Companies. Just, I, I dove in and so I was developing my own critical analysis of, of everything I had been through and starting to see how big this story was, that it wasn't just about me. Um, and so I was extricating myself from the borderline center and I was, you know, I was still seeing a therapist, but I was starting to realize, you know, what, what is this woman I'm paying money doing for me that I can't get from at the time I was in the 12 step world. So that, you know, that I can't get from a 12 step meeting. Um, and so I think by deepening my, my sense of, of my critical consciousness, really, of, of myself in relation to the psychiatric industry, um, that, I, that really helped me get through the worst of the withdrawal because I had this purpose, this, this sense of purpose now as I, as I realized I was a part of this bigger socio-political um, story and that I needed to survive this. I needed to get through this because, um, I needed to show myself that that all those stories I believed in so deeply weren't true. You know that that without drugs and doctors and hospitals, I can't make it in the world because I believed that so deeply for so long. Um, so, I would say in terms of what the withdrawal looked like as the years unfolded, the first year was really hard. Um, I there was there was along the way healing happening and little shifts here and there, um, but. But it was just overall, every day felt best. Every each day that I endured felt like I had accomplished this massive feat. Um, between years one and three, being, being off these drugs, uh, things started to get the 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 shittiness got less shitty. Excuse my language. <laughs> so so I wouldn't say that I I necessarily felt um, great at all. But but things were getting less bad. And at that time, I was really diving deep into this, this movement, whatever we want to call it, that we're all a part of. I was 
writing my, I was writing a blog about my experiences. I was going to conferences. I was sharing my story. I was, I was connecting with people who, through my blog. So, so even though I was still in a lot of pain, physical, emotional pain every day, um, the, and I was, I was paranoid and anxious all the time. Um, and when I say paranoid, I mean, just basically my interactions with other human beings, I would always have this background narrative running of like, what do they actually think about you? Do they actually think that? No, no. Like I couldn't trust anything at face value. I was like unpacking everything all the time, but I had this rich purposeful life that was growing progressively bigger. So in relation, what, you know, one started out as the totality of my, of my experience, just being basically in drug induced hell all day, every day, that was getting smaller and smaller in relation to my life, getting bigger and bigger through this meaningful work I was doing. Um, and so I would say by three years off, I was fully living my life and I still had to, you know, some ongoing digestive issues because of course, 90 to 95% of our serotonin receptors are in our guts. And so when we take SSRIs, it's not just, oh, the little serotonin receptors in your brain, it's mostly altering our entire digestive system. So I had lots of things still going on, but, but they didn't own my day-to-day -day reality. They, they were quieter. They were, you know, I just had so much else there. Um, and so that was really when I started to feel like I was fully living life. I see now that was when the real work began because getting off of psychiatric drugs is just the beginning that it, you know, getting these drugs out of our system is, is really the first step of what has since been for me and for so many of my, my friends and my brothers and sisters in this work. Um, this, this, you know, really lifelong quest of rediscovering our true selves, who, who we always have been, that's, you know, perhaps been suppressed, blocked, um, numbed, whatever word you might use to describe how these meds affect us. Um, the, the true us, each of us is coming back online. And as, as someone who was psychiatrized as a kid, I missed a, learning a lot of basic life skills, like how to have effective communication, um, how to be independent, including financially. And I happen to have been born into a family and a life where I was really blessed with a lot of resources. So I was kind of carried along in my first few years of withdrawal because I couldn't work. I couldn't live alone. I couldn't be relied on. For anything. And I always say this whenever I share my story that in, you know, in many ways, I think my, my socioeconomic um, resources are what led me into the mental health system so deep. But had I not had everything that I was so lucky to have had access to just all kinds of support, um, it, it would have been so much harder for me to get out. Maybe I wouldn't have been able to get out. Um, and so as I was learning how to live again, <laughs> um, you know, a few years in, I, that was when I really started, I, I, it clicked to me that being psychiatrized is not just about this layer of like, oh, I have a mental illness and I need to take meds. There are so many bigger onion layers to peel back um, that, that go so deep at, to the heart of how our society functions. And really a lot of it is about just consumerism and this, this, this very powerful story. So many of us are taught to believe in that pain is something to be gotten rid of, whether it's physical pain. And of course the opiate epidemic is evidence of that or emotional pain, the psychiatric <laughs> drug epidemic is evidence of that. And, and even in withdrawal, you know, where, where I was, I was becoming so critical of the diagnostic paradigm and the whole mental health industry. For a while, I was still on this quest to rid myself of pain. Now it was withdrawal symptoms, but how do I, you know, this is, this is so hard. I'm so afraid of what I'm, what my mind is telling me right now. Um, what if I can never this and never that. And I just, I was so, um, it was the first time that I was fully 
present in, in myself and body, mind and spirit. And so I really, it was about just figuring out how to be in relationship to my pain in, in so many ways. And so I, I think these deeper learnings for me as I've come off and healed from these drugs aren't even about the drugs at all. It's really about how am I in my skin with myself? Um, and I think the what's so hard in early withdrawal when when um, you know when when you're just overwhelmed by pain and you don't yet necessarily feel tangible evidence of healing, um, it's it's really hard to to trust in anything. But once I started to heal and as my evidence started to build, like wow, you know, I used to um, you know not be able to go out to socialize because I was too debilitated by like shame and, and, um, and angst. Now here I am at, you know, just as I started to see all this, these changes happening it became easier and easier to practice being with my, my pain. Um, because I was like deepening, uh, um, my roots and, and strengthening my roots within myself. And, and of course, along the way, I was just coming alive. You know, I, I had my my first orgasm when I was 27 years old, I had no sexual function whatsoever through the most critical years for sexual development. Um, my creative, the creative side of my being that was so vibrant as a child came back online. Um, my ability to feel like intimately connected to another human being, to feel bonded, to feel emotionally just like, the present with someone came back. And, you know, of course, all those years I was labeled borderline um, when I, you know, would be in these like very impulsive and short lasting fleeting relationships and oh, you're promiscuous and blah, 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 all these horribly, horrible words that get thrown at those of us labeled borderline. I now see the parts of me that would have allowed me to bond and to like have intuitive senses of like, this person is right for me or isn't right for me. Those were drugged. Um, and so, and so, um, yeah, so for me, the withdrawal journey is, is about all of this deeper meteor human stuff. And, and, you know, so many people who reach out to me, um, for support around withdrawal, they like, I, and I remember feeling this way too. You, you can, you can, feel as though you have to wait until you heal before you can live. But I've learned with retrospect that you heal through living. You, you heal through speaking for myself when I, I wasn't consciously doing this, but I now look back and I'm like, Oh, this is what was happening. Every day that I made it through, I was putting myself out there, opening myself up to possibility, to opportunity, to connection, to the best of my abilities each day. Um, and it was through that, that I found my sense of purpose and, and some of the most meaningful relationships, the most meaningful relationships I've, I've ever had in my life. It was through just putting myself out there in the midst of the pain, instead of saying to myself, I have to hide away until I've healed from this withdrawal before I can live again. Um, that, that was how I healed and how I'm still healing to this day, because, you know, my central nervous system I'm 12 years in now. Is that right? I think we're 2022, almost I'll be 12 years this fall off. And, and I can tell my central nervous system is still sensitized it's to stress. And, you know, if I'm not taking the care of myself that I know I need through, you know, nutrition and exercise and contemplative practices, and I haven't been doing that much at all these days, I have a 16 month old son, which continues to <laughs> feel surreal much of the time. Um, and so, you know, I, I can feel that my body isn't fully there yet, but the difference is that I'm not afraid of that. And I know that I know why it's happening and I know what I need to do. Um, I just, you know, I'll, I won't be so sleep deprived a year from now and things will feel better. So I, I don't, my struggles don't, 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 I'm not afraid of them. Um, so I think for the last five or so minutes, I wrote down a few um, just kind of key learnings that I've, I've had in my own withdrawal experience that I thought might be helpful to share. Um, 
And and uh, and because this to me again is what withdrawal is all about. And then I'm really eager to hear to connect with everyone in the in the uh, Q and A after. Um, so the first one is to anyone who is thinking about coming off or coming off, know your why. Know why it is that you want to do this. We call it our withdrawal beacon at the withdrawal project. Have something really clear in your mind that you're going towards in, in your quest to come off. For me, it was that curiosity of who, who would I be off of these drugs? I needed to find that out, my baseline. I, I was determined to find that out. Um, the other key lesson for me has been just that, that quick fixes usually lead to more problems <laughs> and that the only way out really is through, however cliched it is to say. And, and you know, realizing again that, that these onion layers, you know, because we can become critical of the diagnoses and the drugs, but still feel this desire to fix our pain, whether it's withdrawal symptoms or whatever else. And in my experience, learning how to be with instead of suppress or run away from has been just so empowering and liberating for me. Um, as I said earlier, your emotional pain is nothing to be afraid of. Um, I often say to people, uh, another, another learning for me that I only really thought of, thought about after the fact, but withdrawal symptoms, you could argue, are a sign of change. Things are happening in your central nervous system, in your body, um, as, as, you're, as they are working to heal themselves, to, to recover from the like structural and functional injuries that these drugs cause. So there, we have all this flexibility to make meaning of withdrawal symptoms in a different way. And I like to say it's a sign of change happening. It's a sign of your body healing. Um, so many people in the withdrawal community, myself included early on, um, it's so natural to feel like, to, to feel just overwhelmed by grief and to feel like all the years we spent psychiatrized were lost, were a waste, um, that we're behind and I've learned since that it's quite the opposite, that none of this is wasted time, that what we learn by surviving psychiatrization <laughs> um, brings so much richness and meaning and connection into our lives. I, I, I know clear as, I just sense clear as day, had I not been in, in the depths of the iatrogenic hell that I was in, an iatrogenic, both from the diagnoses and the existential iatrogenesis, along with the the body, the bodily iatrogenesis. Had I not come to know so intimately what a life not worth living was, I don't think I would have the appreciation that I have today for each little moment um, of life, for the the smell of flowers as they're blooming along the sidewalk here in spring, you know, for the feel of sun on my cheek, these little things that I never had access to when I was psychiatrized. So just know that what you're in right now, if you're in it, is not a waste. It is so full of meaning and it will bring you so much. Um, if it isn't already, if you just hang in there. Um, and I've, well, I've learned through withdrawal how important it is to embrace the unknown, just the, the mystery of life, this quest we're always on to find answers and explanations. And oh, I need to see this expert to help me figure this out. And what does this mean? And da, 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 da. sometimes it's important to have explanatory frameworks, but sometimes it, it isn't. And I find it, it incredibly freeing when I'm able to just let go of the need to know why or what um, something I'm experiencing is. Um, I think I would say uh, just, you know, at the heart of being psychiatrized is the surrender of trust in yourself. And in, in turn, you place it in all these professionals around you and the pills and whatever else. And learning for me on the withdrawal journey that, that the answers don't lie out there, they're in me. And that's really where the name Inner Compass Initiative came from. Um, they, they are in each and every one of us right now, everything we need to, to make it through this. Um, and then the last lesson learning, I would say is just at the end of the day, the experts on withdrawal or those of us who've been through it ourselves, it doesn't matter what letters are after someone's name. It doesn't matter how critical they are of the system, how well-meaning they are. Um, if you haven't been through it, you, you can't know it. It's just unspeakable 
what what the experience of taking these drugs and coming off of these drugs is. And so I think as we forge ahead, to me, it's 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 our mandate as current and ex patients, survivors, whatever labels we want to use, that we we position ourselves as the leaders in this and that we educate professionals, we educate media, we educate families, um, because we know we know this more than anyone and anyone else, and we always will. Um, I'm going to close. I have a couple minutes. I wanted to close with a with a, a little story. Um, so the book Olga mentioned. Um, I just submitted my my second round of edits to my editor. So I, I don't know when it's going to be published, but but it's I've done the bulk of the work, luckily. <laughs> um, but I I was thinking I had written this. I don't know if it will make it into the book or not. But um, I was writing about. <laughs> A few months ago, I was I was listening to an interview I did in 2012 with Will Hall, a Madness Radio interview. Um, I was less than two years off the drugs, and we were talking about withdrawal. And at one point, he asked me just how you know if I felt like I had healed, and I said, in all like just with such earnestness, you know, I re- I feel like I've I've fully healed. I'm my emotion. I'm in good touch with my emotions today. Um, I feel like my life is clicking into place. I, I feel like I've really healed. And so here I am listening to this 12 or I guess 10 years later, 10 years after the interview, 12 years off drugs. And I just am filled with such, um, such like affection for that me then for all that I had no idea was in store for me a lot of healing had happened. That was true, but I had no baseline of comparison for what a purpose, like for what a meaningful, meaningful, you know, integrated life was. And so just the positive shifts that had happened to me, I was like, Oh, I'm healed. It was just beginning. And I, every time I say that to someone, I get the chills because if you're in that place right now where you're in the first year, first few years and and you you're wondering is this as is this as good as it's gonna get is this what my baseline is is this all that's in store? It's just beginning for you. I'm I don't even know you necessarily. Some of you I know, um, and I can tell you that what lies ahead for you is profound and so exciting. You just have to hang in there, and you just have to develop a sense of a deepening sense of trust and faith in your body in your spirit, um, in, in those of us who've walked this path before you, um, yeah, we heal and, and so much lies ahead for you out there. If, if you're struggling to believe that that's the case. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll stop talking. I'm so eager to connect with you all and hear questions and comments and thank you for having me speak. Hi, Laura. Hey, Lucy. I don't know what's happened to Olga. She might come back. Okay. <laughs> In the meantime, I was wondering, can you see the Q&A panel at the bottom? Yeah. Should I should I scroll through and find some questions? Yeah, yeah. maybe these ones that make sense to you. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. And, and apologies to people here. I'm going to do this out of order. Um, let me see here. Do, 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 do. You and Lucy, if you see any too, um, yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm just scrolling through. Uh, Lots of great comments, but I'm still waiting to get to a question. Um, someone asked if I'm on Twitter. I am on Twitter. I'm terrible at Twitter, but I'm going to try to get better at Twitter this year. I'm just at, at Laura Delano. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah, Lucy, if you find one, just jump in. Someone is asking, would you have any 
support, I guess, to offer if someone was setting up an initiative similar to Inner Compass in their country? Oh, yeah. I mean, we would we would be happy to help. Um, I mean, one of our big dreams, if we're still so small and need more resources and funding and all that, but we hope to be able to develop chap um, chapters or affiliates elsewhere. But so if you wanted to help bring Inner Compass to where you are, we can totally help with that. But if you want to start your own initiative with a similar mission, um, just email us at hello at the intercompass.org because we're always um, connecting with people who are developing other initiatives and, and groups and organizations and just to learn about what we're doing, what we're all doing to stay in touch. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so email us there for sure. Yeah, I feel like your organization is a pioneer for so many others. Um, and it's been People have posted it so much in the comments today. Oh, I'm, that's so meaningful to hear. Well, just I, what I feel most, I, I'm I'm proud that we are a layperson organization. That that we are founded and led by those of us who've been through it. And and um, one of our you know our our goals is to, and I think we're on our way there to to help subvert or invert, I guess you could say, the, the power dynamic when it comes to knowledge transfer. You know, our society right now views, you know, oh, you need, we, we defer to professionals and experts um, to tell us, to teach us, to educate us. And we, we like the idea of flipping that on its head <laughs> so that one day, not just even with psychiatric drugs, with, with all pharmaceutical drugs and other consumer products too, the experts are actually the people who've, who've had the experiences directly. Um, so, so uh, yeah, thank, but thanks for that comment, Lucy. Um, I'm trying to see if uh, there's a comment here that maybe I could turn. Oh, no, I know that's hard to turn to. Yeah, let's see. Any, are you seeing other questions? I'm just scrolling from the top down. So it is tough. A lot of people have put them in the comments. Um, if anyone has put questions in the comments, put them in the Q&A box. Oh, whoopsie. Um, I've been looking at the comments the whole time. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. No wonder it's taking so long. Okay. <laughs> it's been a long day. My, I also, I also grew up this morning. So. <laughs> I, understand. Um, I also think, um, I don't know if Olga's going to come back. So I want to just introduce myself in case in case people missed that, Please. I'm Lucy. I, I do the admin for the Institute. So a lot of the technical stuff. And um, if you email the Institute, I'm likely to reply to you. And, and um, please do if you want to follow up on the conference. Um, so, oh, Olga's back. I'm so sorry. I'm back. No worries. <laughs> It happens. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the electricity went out oh, oh and everything went. I'm so sorry. Well, I can, can dive in now that I know where the questions see. are. I can yeah. dive in. I can't believe yeah. I, of course it's in the chat. So someone's asking about um, why Effexor isn't available in liquid. And I actually am pretty sure that it it is. Um, if there a great website, I for anyone looking to um, find out what what form different forms and formulations your drug is available as, um, you can go to drugbank.ca. It's actually a Canadian website, but the American drug bank is not useful. Um, we also at the withdrawal project, um, if you click taper on the main menu and then scroll to um, I think it's step eleven. Click on step eleven. Um, determining if your drug is taper friendly. We walk you through how to, to find out all the different um, forms and formulations your drug is available as. Um, so let's see. Um, bo -bo 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 -bo. This, this is a similar question, but someone's asked, how do you think that grassroots organizers can come together in more consistent ways on a large oh. national scale and potentially international um, to oh, it's this a information question. and educate the public? It's such a good question. We just need to get a couple of us to find the funding to organize. I, at least I think, I think the most fun way too would be to 
find some funding to actually organize a conference just for us. Um, and so if anyone is interested in doing that, we've talked for years about doing it. And now that COVID seems to, <laughs> fingers crossed, I'm not, I don't even want to say anything more. I don't want to jinx myself. But um, if anyone is interested in, you know, trying to explore that, con contact us because we've we've wanted to organize an in, an in-person conference for like in people, just those of us living our lives, doing this work um, to come together and, and help each other and like basically build at the neighborhood level um, mm -hmm. resources, supports, communities, because I think change has to happen there. It has to happen in all these places, all these levels. Um, but at the neighborhood level, it's essential. So get in touch with us at ICI. Um, I see a question about protracted. Um, mm -hmm. Someone says, can you comment about severe protracted withdrawal and things that can be done to get through that and how the brain and body can heal? Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with the term protracted withdrawal, the way most, a lot of us define it in the withdrawal community is if you've been in withdrawal for 18 months or more, um, there's acute withdrawal, which is like the beginning, and then there's post-acute and then protracted. Um, and so, yeah, many people, not everyone, but many people find that it, it is years of healing. And, and I would say to, to anyone in that place that this idea of having to do something, um, you know, to that, like, there's something out that you just need to do, um, I have found a lot of freedom in, in just letting go of that and trusting that the, the body has this wisdom. The, the brain is so plastic. So we are such resilient physical beings. Um, and so focusing and less on like, what can I do to heal the protracted and more on how can I cultivate being with myself, mm -hmm. my pain, yeah. my mind yeah. while I'm in this, I would say. Mm -hmm. And you're so far from alone. And come to our Q and A's um, in the Inner Compass Conversations Facebook group because mm -hmm. we do them regularly, and it's all about open-ended Q and A's about withdrawal. So if mm -hmm. people have quite other questions about protracted, um, some of our team have been in protracted themselves and can talk about it too. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't see the questions because I joined. So no worries. <laughs> ah. I, I see another, I, yeah. I, a, good, a great one. Someone asks, did your healing come partly from reading the book Man's Search for Meaning by Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl? It was mm -hmm. and is one of the best books I ever read, Healing Through Meaning. It helped me get through a debilitating chronic illness. Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. To anyone out there who isn't familiar with that book or who hasn't read it, please pick it up. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He was ironically Amazing. a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, his it's a beautiful book that, you know, dives into the unspeakable darkness of what, you know, what he survived in concentration camps. Um, but it really focuses on this, this idea that the objective to living isn't to be happy. It's to have meaning. And I read that book in towards the end of so somewhere in my first year off. And it was, it, sh it shifted everything for me. It was huge in, in that, when I mentioned in the story, just realizing that I was still kind of indoctrinated into this idea that pain is something to be gotten rid of. It really, really helped. It planted the seed in that journey, you know, of, of learning how to be with my pain and see, see how meaningful it is. See this response to things that are happening, um, of course, in our lives, but obviously in our bodies too, when it comes to withdrawal. So I highly recommend that as a book. Um, so Dave has a great, Hi, Dave. This is Dave Walker. Um, hey, I noticed through the health struggles of a close relation that an antidepressant that oh, the antidepressant drugs are being repositioned as treatment for chronic physical pain. We pushed back on a health provider associated with a prestigious clinic on this issue, and they were stunned. How do we widen the visibility of this information to other areas of healthcare where psychiatry has influenced what's increasing increasingly considered the new approach to pain? Oh, it's a great question. I mean. I'm more optimistic about reaching non-psychiatric professionals because the stakes are less high for them. You know, their whole identity isn't dependent on 
psychiatric drugs, although 76% of psychiatric drugs in the US are less this number, the last number I read are prescribed by general practitioners. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is just in our own lives, um, in our own day-to-day -day lives, any chance you have to have a conversation about this with someone when it feels right, when, when you feel like there's an openness to curiosity to it, to, to the person, um, that's activism to, to be, you know, just communicating with people. And I mean, hopefully all the great research that's starting, starting to creep into the literature, you know, what Mark's doing and others, um, hopefully that will help to make it easier to be taken seriously because there's going to be a peer reviewed evidence base for some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big beast we're up against because the education, you know, the continuing education of, of all doctors is so corrupted by the pharmaceutical industry that, you know, there are a lot of layers of influence to get through. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that or, but let's see. Um, how would, okay. Well, okay. I think um, we've got one more. Oh, do we have time for one more? Is that are we out of time? Well, quickly take it if it's a okay. quick one. There's yeah. one. Um, yeah. Let me see. It's Lucy, do you have? Any, I'm trying to. There's so many, and I'm feeling the one know. that. I mean, there are so many, and I feel like that's why it's so good that yeah. you do Q and A's. There, I see one that's super important to respond yeah. to. And I, what someone asks, how do you taper when you feel so ill? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, what I'll say, the, the way we talk about the, our philosophy at the withdrawal project is that withdrawal symptoms are a sign of central nervous system destabilization. And um, oftentimes you'll, you know, myself included, when I came off, you just, you're so detri I just gotta get off these drugs. I have to push through, need to make another mm -hmm. cut. I know I feel horrible. That can, many people find that actually can end up compounding problems, making things so much worse than you even imagined possible. So the way we we um, talk about making decisions around tapering at the withdrawal project is to listen to your body. And and mm -hmm. most most people find that if they are feeling super ill and super disrupted by withdrawal, that that not making any further cuts, just holding steady where they are. Sometimes people have to updose, meaning go back up mm -hmm. to the last dose they were on where they felt stable. Yeah. If they can do that the quicker you do that, the better the chances that, that might help. It doesn't always help. Um, but, but that pushing through and continuing to taper when one is destabilized almost always never goes well and can really prolong the healing timeline. So holding steady and waiting until things stabilize is the, what the harm reduction approach is that we, we take at the withdrawal project. Um, yeah. Well, th thank you so much, Laura. Oh, been, that was fabulous. I found myself resonating with so much what, of what you were saying. And I was also really happy when you, that you also bring forth the, the idea of the expertise of, of those of us who have been through this, uh, you know, because there is such an interest in, you know, of course, there'll be an interest in commercializing this, of course. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, the knowledge, the knowledge is found so much within yeah, the community of those of us who've been this very long and often hard journey. Indeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much for being, for yeah. having me. And to anyone who has questions that weren't answered, you know, contact us, hello at theintercompass.org, find us on Facebook, um, mm. sign up for our newsletter. We're here for you. We're, we're, you're not alone. And thanks, no. Lucy, thanks, Olga. <laughs> and by the way, the Inner Compass, if, if you can't find your answer there, well, you know, probably, well, you, you can find everything. I uh, Truly, it's a really good website. I oh, highly, highly recommend it. Thanks. We Thank worked you. hard on it. Thanks, Olga. Um, Thank okay, you. everyone. Well, take care. Bye. 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 And now we, we have the break and uh, uh, then the movie, uh, the documentary. I want to call it a movie, but uh, it's, it's very good. It's very exciting. It's very interesting. I do recommend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm.